Hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good whatever part of the day it is where you are. I am Tigris Osborne. I am NAFA's Director of Community Outreach. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time for the NAFA webinar series, NAFA is the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. We are a 51-year-old civil rights organization working towards equality at every size. We do that work through advocacy, education, and community building, primarily in the United States, although we certainly support our friends and, um, and fellow activists all over the world. And today we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Bill Fabry, who is a founder of NAFA. And before we get to Bill and our introduction of Bill and, um, and our discussion of his work with NAFA and with other organizations and 51 years of activism towards size acceptance, mm -hmm. Um, I just have a couple of NAFA announcements that I would like to share with you. Um, first of all, if you'd like to learn more about NAFA, we encourage you to visit us on our recently updated fabulous website, nafa.org. That is N-A-A-F-A dot O-R-G. Our website has been updated to be more mobile friendly. Uh, we recently, uh, beginning October 1st, introduced a new blog, uh, the NAFA Community Voices blog, which features guest bloggers and NAFA members. Uh, talking about a variety of topics in fat activist history, fat community building, and um, and numerous other things that you might find interesting. We make announcements there. We also make announcements in our monthly newsletter, which is free to members and other interested people in community. Um, we are able to do these things and bring these kinds of educational uh, programming this kind of educational programming to you, including our NAFA webinar ser series, which is free to the general public. Um, through the support of our members and other genu generous contributors. And if you would like to support this kind of work, we encourage you to donate. Also, you can do that through our website and our website also gives you information about how to donate by text if you're a mobile user and you prefer to donate that way. So again, that website is nafa.org. Um, in addition to today's webinar, uh, we have one more webinar coming up in October. Dr. Joy Cox will be joining us on October 24th to talk about her new book, Fat Girls in Black Bodies. You can find that information also at nafa.org backslash webinars. And, um, and we'll be planning other webinars for November and December, which are soon to be announced. So please stay tuned for those upcoming activities. And with no further ado, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Bill Fabry. In 1969, Bill Fabry came up with the concept of a national organization to serve as an advocacy group for fat people. He drafted bylaws, rounded up some individuals to serve as the first board of directors, and the National Association to Aid Fat, uh, fat Americans, which is what NAFA was called at the time, was born. Bill has been a member of NAFA, now known as the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, and we'll talk a little bit about that name change, for 51 years. He participated actively in NAFA leadership until the early 90s, in 1991, Bill became the co-founder of the Council on Size and Weight Discrimination. He now serves as the council's president. Bill has also served on the membership committee of the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health, ASDA, since 2008. At age 79, Bill is retired. We'll talk about how retired <laughs> Bill is, uh, but working harder than ever, running a small business, supporting Black Lives Matter and indigenous rights work, and continuing to work toward ending bullying and fat stigmatization. You can learn more about Bill and the organizations that he worked with at nafa.org, cswd.org, which is the Council for Size and Weight Discrimination, and asda.org, again, the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health. Ladies and gentlemen, friends of all gens, Mr. Bill Fabry. Bill, thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tigris, for inviting me. And by the way, um, I do have some notes. I'll consult my notes now and then. Um, I just want to congratulate you for, uh, you know, ascending to the um, chair of the organization uh, on January 1st. And also uh, Darlene, to thank Darlene for her years of service. And, uh, and <clears throat> in advance, because she's still around and there's still lots of work to do. <laughs> and, Absolutely. Uh, 
I, but um, Bill is uh, talking about Darlene Howell, who's with us today, not just as the technical director of our webinars. Darlene um, does, I do the front of camera stuff. Darlene does the back of camera stuff. But of course, Darlene has been our board chair for five years. Um, and Darlene, if, do you want to turn your camera on now and say hello? Darlene Howell, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Darlene. <laughs> and Dar Darlene's going to continue in the role of board chair um, through the end of this year. And then as we announced today, you can see more information about this on our website. Um, I will take over as board chair on January 1st. And we're thankful for it. <laughs> we're really excited about having Tigers be the board chair elect currently. And even as of January 1st, the board chair. I believe that she has a unique perspective and vision that is needed in NAFA in taking us forward into the future. So it was, that was why I approached her about the possibility of taking over the uh, chairmanship and was delighted when she accepted. Absolutely. And, and since the invitation to attend this today came from Tigris and I realized she was, uh, able to, you know, she was going to be moderating and I have seen her moderating style before. It was totally fearless on my part to accept. <laughs> I'm, I'm gentle as a moderator, I promise. Um, I um, appreciate the attention to the announcement for today and we will talk a little bit about, I, mean, I am gonna ask Bill a little bit later for some advice as the upcoming chair but I actually want to go back to the beginning. So we'll get to the future a little bit later in the webinar, but I actually want to um, go a little chronologically and I want to go back to 1969. Um, let's start at the beginning, Bill. Tell us well, a little bit more of that backstory. So we heard in your bio that you had this concept that you wanted to start this organization. What inspired that? Yeah, well, let's, let me try to, to fill in the blanks a little bit. Um, well, first, let me talk a little bit about the time, the time and, and place of all this. Uh, this was the 1960s we're talking about. Um, I, I looked up a few dates. In 1963, Martin Luther King wrote his letter from the Birmingham, Birmingham jail. All right, that was 63. That was six years before we started. Um, in 1967, that was uh, that year was uh, the issue of the Saturday Evening Post that author Lou Lauterbach wrote his famous article called More People Should Be Fat. That was really revolutionary because he was not saying that people should try to be fat. He was trying to say there are fat people and they're making their lives miserable if they're all on diets because they're food deprived and they're irritable and, and they're judgmental about other fat people. He went on and on to say this. Uh, and that article gave me a lot of inspiration. But let me, let me get back to that in a minute. In 1969, was June 13th was our first meeting. Um, two weeks later was the Stonewall Uprising in New York City, in which gay rights got a jump start. Um, a lot of people don't, I, I've encountered gays who don't know what Stonewall was. And, uh, you know, it's where a bunch of gay men and, and also uh, lesbians came in. Everybody got involved in confronting the New York City police who raided, had raided the Stonewall Tavern and made the usual arrests and so forth. Uh, and it was at that, at that event, which lasted several days, that finally the mayor told the police, lay off the gays. We got more serious things to do. And... Um, so they, they got a jump start, and that was only two weeks after our first meeting. Uh, in 1972, three, three years later, was when Ms. Magazine started with, uh, you know, and Gloria Stein Steinman was either involved in the beginning or took it over at some point. So we had the feminists going on, and I got inspiration for NAFA from all of these groups. Um, I'm not gay myself, but I totally relate to them because... I have, uh, as a man who has always admired the larger figure in a woman, I always felt the si similar pressures on me that, that I realized that you know, gays must encounter when they're growing up. 
I'll get into that a little bit later because part of my my motivation and my anger was that you know how dare anybody tell me what I should find attractive. Anyway, <clears throat> but I digressed. Lauterbach wrote his article in the Post. I read it. I said, "Holy smokes, this is revolutionary! I'm going to make copies for everybody that I know." Um, and then I said, "Well, I could stand around." His Xerox machine had just been invented, you understand. So <clears throat> I said, I can either stand around at the Xerox machine forever making copies of this article, or I can just order reprints. So I contacted Curtis Publishing that was put out the post and got a, a price, 70 bucks for 500 copy minimum order. The 500 copies, I don't know 500 people. How do I get those out to people? How do I afford 70 hours for reprints? I said, well, I'll just get some people together who all agree that we should disseminate this article. And then I was in staying in the shower one night and I suddenly said, wait a minute, what am I saying? You've got to get some people together to disseminate copies of the article. How about getting people together to fight the things that the article complains about? Right. Right. Said, well, surely somebody's already done that, right? So I did some library research and I found no such organization exists. I got to be real friendly with research libra with um, reference librarians over the court. Because these are the days before the internet. Everything was done in print. So, and then once I got the idea in the shower, I said, well, wait a minute. I mean, I don't know how to go about this. I have no training in nonprofits or organizations, but I did have some college experience with engineering societies. So I said, well, I'm secretary of the college branch of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. And as secretary, I had all sorts of experience of trying to get people together. So, so maybe I can do it because of that. So I made some phone calls. This is the long version. I shouldn't go into the long version. Made some phone calls to every louder back I could find in the New York City area until I found somebody who said, I think you must be talking about my cousin. He's in Staten Island. Let me, let me give you his number. Anyway, I tracked down louder back and I said, I, I want, it's a great article in the post, but I want to propose an organization to you. But can I, may I write you a letter? And he said, yes. Uh, what address should I write it to? And he gave me, and so I wrote a letter and I still have a copy of that letter. It was lost for about 10 years. And then I um, paid a, a, posted a reward of a hundred dollars. Anyone who has a copy of the letter, <laughs> somebody found an old copy of the letter floating around the NAFA office or it had been abandoned, I guess. So I have my letter and it outlines what basically is the size acceptance movement even with local chapters, for heaven's sakes. I ought to publish that letter. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, all these, these early uh, the things, the uh, Constitution, my letter, all that sort of stuff, that's all, that's all going to um, the archives at Cornell University. They've agreed to accept the stuff. Uh, another person who has a lot of stuff like that is, is Barbara Altman Bruno, and she's already you know, send a lot of her stuff there. I have cartons and cartons of stuff like that. Anyway, um, I'm gonna have, have to say anyway, um, an awful lot. You're in good company with that, Bill. I do that a lot on our webinar, so don't worry. I realized at some point in this business of talking to Lauterbach and, and writing that letter, I said, this is, I'm putting a lot of time in on this, but I, I have no choice. I mean, I can't walk away from this. Having found out that there's no such organization one one should exist and that this, this could be helpful to people. I just can't, I can't walk away from it. And I had an engineering career I was working on at the time. And I was an engineer, a biomedical research engineer for 30 years during all of this. But, um, I said, this has got to be a priority. Eventually, I came to realize it's a lifelong commitment. And I had to make a lot of decisions along the way as to what priority to give various things in my life. And that was a very high priority. 
All right, going back a minute, what would motivate me to be even interested in the subject at all? Well, I told her that in, in school, I realized, I think I realized in, in, when I was in kindergarten that I like, was attracted to chubby girls. So you weren't a fat guy yourself? No. I and think a lot of people who, who have only seen photos of you online and have only seen your headshot online, who know you through your writing and through hearing your stories or hearing you in interviews, do not realize that the person who started the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance has, is not and has never been a fat guy. Yeah, I was a lot skinnier then too. Um, though at, at this point, after, for the last 30 years, I've been technically defined as, and please pardon the word, obese by the US government. I'm just on their borderline. So I'm officially fat, by the way. But that, 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 that's neither here nor there. I was thin at the time. Uh, in the course of being attracted to the larger ladies, um, and I had lots of friends of all sizes. Um, I developed, uh, developed a lot of anger about, about it, be, about the fact that, you know, that I had to be in the closet about it, that I had, you know, couldn't, my, my, one of my best friends, I had invited a, a slightly chubby role to the prom. He said, who are you taking to the prom? I said, so-and-so gave the name. He said, well, why would you go on, want to go out with that pig? That's when he became my ex-friend. Um, so eventually, my, I met a, a woman in Ithaca, New York, named Joyce, and seriously dated her. And we decided, or I, she, she and I decided to get married. And, you know, I really became intimately familiar with all the crap that she puts up with, put up with. Um, the, the, the first thing had to do with parents parents' reluctance to accept the idea that I actually wanted to marry somebody who's fat. My parents, I love my parents. I still love my parents, although they've gone 35 years. But that was one area that they were blind about. Um, so she needed to get a, uh, we needed to get a, a marriage license. And in the state of New York at that time, you needed a blood test. They were looking for syphilis. So this has been dropped, I think, but at the time, so she needed a blood test and she lived in Great Neck, Long Island and didn't know any doctors there because they'd moved recently. So somebody gave her the name of a doctor and she went to see the doctor and was ushered into the, his office and said, what, he said, what can I do for you? She said, I need a, a blood test in order to get married. And he was astonished and he looked at her and he said, who would want to marry you? Wow. That's even worse than some of the other medical stories we hear. Imagine how I felt upon hearing that. And she was a truthful person. She didn't make that up. Um, she had low self-esteem. And despite that, of all the, the girls that I had dated, she had more self-esteem than any of the others. Was first, you know, she was lively, and interesting, engaged kind of person. So, but the basic root of it all was the low self-esteem. She couldn't get work, she couldn't get jobs. She had to take the crappiest jobs while I was finishing for my degree. The, the things that involve working all night at the post office, for example. And the crew that worked all night next to her at the post office uh, were, most of them were fat. Most of them couldn't get jobs in a regular day job. Hmm, what does that tell you? Clothes, I couldn't, you know, I wanted to buy her birthday present. And she badly needed a, a blouse. So I went running around Rochester, New York, trying to find a blouse in her size. And I only found one blouse. All the stores I visited, even the Lane Bryant didn't have her size. I think it was size 52 or 50 or something. And I found one blouse and I bought it. She was grateful because you learn to be grateful. If you can only buy one blouse, you're grateful for that blouse. So. And Bill, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you here, but I just, I no, want to please, please do. Well, I want to highlight for people who are listening, especially for people who are, who may be new to hearing these kinds of stories that, because so often when people think about what 
fat activism is about or what size acceptance is about they think it's only about that self-esteem part that you talked about like that she did she feel good about herself or not did you know did people make fun of you because you liked fat girls or not but you're you're highlighting some of the things that we work on as an organization now right and some of the things that we care deeply about as access as as activists you're highlighting things that have to do with access and employment and medical stigma and you know like it's not just was the doctor mean to her because the doctor asked if she didn't believe she was getting married it's also how then do you trust that person with your health care right exactly it's not, it's not just is it inconvenient that you have to work at night it's also like then what if you lose that job and there are no others like right there's all of these pieces that are that are like everything you're describing is trauma and then it's also how does that trauma then get built on into even greater trauma and as you're saying that's not just one individual trauma that's systemic trauma so i i just want to frame that for people who are maybe not getting that this is like a such a like one piece of a huge puzzle that then you begin to put together an organization like you're thinking how can i help my my girlfriend my fiance my wife but then it becomes part of something that is because what she's experiencing is systemic what you end up building becomes part of battling something more systemic well and they just didn't do it just for her because they said there are millions of people like her right and they're not they don't all have a loving devoted husband to to make make them feel good about themselves and even and then and even did, then i couldn't even then i couldn't did you and did she have a sense that there were more people you mentioned other fat people she worked with but like did you have a sense of where other fat people were in the community or did she have a sense of that or was it really like i don't mean to ask you to speak for her but as as much as you know being in an intimate relationship and what you saw yourself in your own community where 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 were the other folks what was the sense of community or isolation around it oh it was totally isolation Nobody who, was, nobody who was fat had any kind of a support group about their size. They had friends and the friends would say, I love you despite your size, or that I don't see you as a fat person. You know, I mean, there, there are lots of people who can go through their entire life and not encounter you know, any personal grief from friends about their size because their friends don't see their size. You know, I know, you know lots, of, lots of minorities go through this kind of a, of a thing. But in, in 1970, the Weight Watchers organization, which I did despise, but well, that's another story, um, estimated that there were more than a million people in this country who weighed over 500 pounds. So I said, well, you know, there's over a million probably miserable people out there, not just because of being fat per se, but because of how people treat them being fat. I mean, there's a need for it, whether they want to want to do this or not, whether they know it or not. Uh, an organization has to fight a battle for them. Well, we, we get back into this whole first meeting thing, and I'll explain that in a minute. I did get these people together to agree on a place to meet. We met at Lauterbach's house in Staten Island. I was able. Uh, by hook or by crook to round up, you know, the seven or eight people to do this. And then we had the meeting and we established, we approved a, a draft constitution and all that sort of thing. And I wanted to be, I wanted Lauterbach to be president. And Lauterbach said, no, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. He says, I'm not a public person. I'm going to have to do my, a book tour for my, for, the, for my book, but I, I'm, I'm dreading that. He says, I, I don't want to be the spokesperson. He said, I'm just glad we're, we're doing this, but, you know, you do it. And it's one of these things where, like in the Army, you want volunteers for a hazardous mission. Everyone takes one step back, and you're the only one standing there. Do you get elected? Uh, there was a, so that's how I became president. I said, ideally, we, we talked about this at the very first meeting. Ideally, we should be a fat person. A fat, fat, either you, you wrote the Post article, or you and your wife are fat, or somebody, somebody who's, who's fat should do it. I don't have the personal hands-on experience of being fat. I just know that people I have loved 
are fed and what they go through. That's not the same as being in someone's shoes itself, what they call the hands-on experience. But so I was relieved. It took about 10 years, but gradually we got more fat people into leadership. And, and uh, so I was, uh, you know, gradually, you know, occupied a less important role as time went on. So what was the what what was the makeup of that first group then? Was it mostly fat people and you, or was it mostly people like you and a couple of fat people? It was it was a mix. It was a mix, a uh, mixture. I would say two thirds were fat, one third were not. Our first, and most of these people have either have either uh, died or become you know, or you don't know where they are. You can't track them down. It's hard to track down people that long ago because they don't tend to join Facebook or classmates.com. Some of them are not computer literate. Uh, for the BBC interview I did last year, I was able to track down one lady, Sue Morgan, one of our co-founders. She was wonderful and uh, so happy that she's still around. And I since then met, found her ex-husband and he's, he's a good guy. He was thin. Um, so it was a mix. And we were mostly married couples. We, we didn't form the organization as a dating society or to, to meet anybody. We, we just had a jo job to do. Um, and what else was the group like demographically? It was a mix. First of all, we we're all whites, which I think is a big mistake. Um, we, we were all married. Uh, those of, except for one, no, even he was married. Being all married, we of course had completely forgotten what it's like to be singles and, and wonder what, who you're gonna go out with Friday night, which turned out to be an extremely powerful force that we hadn't reckoned with. Um, that, that becomes a huge factor in how NAFA develops over the years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we even found ourselves starting a dating service within NAFA just because there was a vacuum. There were no dating, there were kind of just the start of computer dating, but none of them provided for the fact that you might be fat or you might be looking to date a fat person. So we started one and some marriages resulted and, and we ran that for several years. Um, at that time, when we started that, Lauterbach dropped out because he said, I don't, I, he, he said, I think you have important work to do, but I don't wanna be involved in something that is, is going to end up being distracted by a dating service. And I think at various points throughout NAFA's history, including now that there are people who have very mixed feelings about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were very happy when other organizations filled in the gap as far as dating is concerned. You have fat nightclubs, you have other, you know, some of the, some of the computer dating services have expanded to provide for being fat, although match.com is horrible. They, they say that the only category you can check is um, have a few pounds to lose. If you're fat, you can check that box. Have a few pounds to lose. Yeah, no. But, <laughs> no. Know, we're, we're, we're out there program. Don't understand people. Yeah, whatever. Now there's, now there's, uh, you know, now there's, organ now there's the dating services for elderly, for Jewish people for, you know, Chinese, uh, on and on. So uh, I'm not. Yeah, the internet has provided a lot of options in terms of dating by identity or by category or whatever. But you're, you're right, like in the, you know, across, you know, across five decades of NAFA, dating has played dating, sex, attraction, um, particularly for heterosexual folks has played a role in NAFA's social life at, in various ways throughout. Right, that's true. But how come, because I hang out primarily with activists and, and um, people who are doing various things that are productive, I discovered somewhere along the line that more than half of my female friends are lesbians. Because they're putting all the energy into it. And that's great. So, I mean, I have a very wide latitude of, uh, I totally respect people's lifestyles, whatever they are. And, uh, you know, you know, I just welcome that. Well, anyway. So was that part of, but that wasn't part of the demographic in the early days of NAFA. No. In the early days of NAFA, it was 
heterosexual married couples who were white in the, that first meeting, at least. When did you, right. as NAFTA, so tell us about how NAFTA started to grow and whether those demographics shifted or when they shifted or whether they didn't as NAFTA started to grow. NAFTA had very little growth in the first couple of years. We defined anyone who joined at that time as a charter member and so they would have to pay only $6 dues for the rest of their lives. And in those days, in the 70s, $6 was considered a lot of money. There were people who told us, you're, you're going to waste your time with this. Nobody's going to send in $6 to belong to an organization like this. Um, but eventually, I gave a, um, a talk at, a, at the New York Mensa Society. Uh, the first public talk I ever gave on this subject was at a Mensa meeting. I said, these bunch of smart people, they, they'll understand what I'm talking about. And um, in the audience and the Mensa group was a personal friend of a New York Times reporter who said, you got to find out, you got to talk to these people. There's a possible news here. So the New York Times did a spread on us in what they called at that time the family section. And it was two thirds of a page. It was quite large with photographs and all that. Really respectable interview. And after that, we got all kinds of publicity. I appeared on talk shows and, and uh, I and other people appeared on talk shows. And what year was that? That was uh, the Times of Peace was 1971, I think. Okay, so still pretty early. Now there's still no internet, you right. understand. This is 20 years before. Uh, but the Times did it, and I, I, I knew they had written the article, but they didn't, couldn't tell me when it was going to come out. And then one morning at 7 a.m., my, my phone rings at my, at my house, wakes, wakes up me and my wife. It's the London Mirror. They said, we just saw your article in the Times. Is, is your comments in there correct? Can we quote you on that? I said, well, I hope so. I haven't seen the article yet. <laughs> That's how I found out that it was on the newsstands. And then it got picked up in the International Herald Tribune and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, but it's all labor intensive. I mean, you know, for every time you get publicity like that, you can answer lots of phone calls and you can return lots of phone calls and you can spend four or five hours doing that for one exposure and you don't get hundreds of members as a result. Right. Because because people in those days, and still today, to some extent, their the usual re reaction I got from my friends when I said told them what I was doing with NAFA is they would say, "Well, if the fatties don't like how they're treated, why don't they just lose weight?" I heard that a few hundred thousand times, and I had to get a whole bunch new bunch of friends, obviously. <laughs> um, so it grew, but slowly, because it was all by mail. I wrote lots of letters to the editor. I learned how to do it and get published. Um, and that oftentimes would lead to additional publicity. And here, here's a little anecdote. Look Magazine, which no longer exists. Look Magazine, which was sort of like life as a weekly. Lauterbach had a friend uh, at Look Magazine. So I said, well, maybe they can get us an article. And he said, well, I'll discuss it with my friend. His friend told him, Look Magazine isn't going to do an article on you until you come back with a thousand members. If you have a thousand members, they'll consider it. They, yeah, well, how do you get the thousand members if you don't have a Look Magazine article? Right. How'd you do he, it? Even the Times article, the Times, I think. Directly, I would say probably we've got 100 members as a direct consequence of that Times article. That was a real shot in the arm. Um, again, membership was $6. Everyone was saying, well, who's going to spend $6? Well, anyway, so it was a long, a long thing. And it wasn't until 1980 that, that I um, began to see some, some real uh, inspiration. 1977 through 1980. Now, it was 10 years later that I got began to see some really inspired. I mean, I basically had to reach out and recruit people to be in leadership. 
and I tried to recruit as many of those people being fat as I could. Marvin Grossworth, the former chair, chairman of, of America Mensa, was, was on our board. You know, I recruited Marvin. And here's a story about Marvin. He, he was president of Mensa, and the, I offered to give a, a talk. I told you about that. But meanwhile, the Mensa's secretary in Brooklyn said, you ought to talk to our chair, Marvin Grossworth. He would be good for you to talk to. I'm not saying why. Well, he was a fat man. I'm they not saying you, why, though. There's also this element of embarrassment you know, over here. <laughs> right. are, nobody wants to use the word fat or even own up to, uh, to it. So here's his phone number. I'll tell him that someone is calling who wants to discuss a possible uh, meeting. So I called him and I told him about NAFA and I talk, spoke for at least half an hour until he said, you know, I realized something, but it took me half an hour to realize it. You're serious. This is not a practical joke that somebody is playing on me. You really are doing this. I said, yeah, we have a board of directors and we have, uh, you know, I explained to him what had gone on and he looked up the times piece. Oh, he didn't look up the times piece because he was in the times piece. This all happened before the times did its story because he's in the picture in the article. All right. <clears throat> anyway, so he, I learned half of my writing skills came from learning to Marvin. He was also taught uh, writing at the new school in New York City. So he, we would do a draft of a newsletter and we'd send it to him and he would mark it up with his crayon and, and uh, a red <laughs> pencil. And, and uh, that's how I learned writing, part of how I learned writing. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm, somebody, here we are 51 years later, Marilyn Wan, who was one of the pioneers, who I'll get back to in a minute, said she thinks maybe over the course of the 50 years, there have been three waves in this, in this movement. The first wave being all that early stuff. This is all before the internet <clears throat> and even including uh, um, Bill Donahue talk shows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That was like the first third. She says, it seems to go in generations. You have a, a generation of activists for about 15 years and they get replaced by a new generation of activists for another 15 years, that sort of thing. The second generation was probably from 1980 to the invention of the internet. So that was 15 or 20 years. And then, then the internet and everything exploded because people started writing blogs and, and uh, all sorts of really great stuff started happening and people were able to communicate with each other better than they ever had before. Can you imagine you have to write a letter before then you had to write a letter, wait about five days for the letter to be received at the other end, the other person to draft a letter, a response, and there's postal delays. I mean, no wonder everything took years. So do you remember what year it was when you finally got that 1,000th member? Mm. Yeah, probably about, I'm gonna say probably uh, 80, 1986 or 87 or 88 around the time that we hired Sally Smith to be our first executive director. It was in 1988 and the move, and under Sally, we moved the office from Floral Park, New York to uh, Sacramento, California. And I think we had about a thousand members at that time. And when did it start to, is that when it started to feel really national? Cause I know the name was national. You had a vision for it to be national. When did it start to feel like it was really national? Well, we had actually had two conventions in Los Angeles. So it began to feel national long before that. Um, we had a print newsletter that would go to a wide area of mailing and some even abroad. Um, let's see. I think, I think you'll, I think I, I'd like to interrupt at some point I, I had, I said, some point I should mention a few names of people that were instrumental in giving me inspiration. Absolutely. And I said, I'll just jot down a few names. 
Well, I ended up with the whole paper full of names. And I said, well, the only hazard of this paper, the nasty thing about this paper is all the names that get left out. But it's, it's worth taking a minute if we have the time. Yeah, we have time. In fact, this is actually a good time for me to say, folks, um, we, is, if you've been with us before, you know, we usually do these for about an hour. Um, Bill has graciously agreed to give us more than an hour, so we're going to go a little longer than that. We're not going to keep you here for like five or six hours. Last time Bill and I talked, I think we talked for three hours. We're not going to keep you here <laughs> for three whole hours, but we are going to go a little longer than an hour, probably more like an hour and a half. So um, if you have... Um, you know, you can go ahead and start asking questions in the chat. We're gonna go through a little bit more history. Um, I have several more questions that I wanna ask Bill, and I know that ha he has some more things he wants to talk about, but you're welcome to start posing questions in the chat if you have questions as we go along. Um, and Bill, go ahead and hit us with that list of names, and then as we go, you're welcome to drop other names as you think of them, and I know that people understand that when you have 51 years of names worth of worthy of mention that um that that they can't take it personally if you know if they've not been mentioned we don't have seven hours for you to mention every name um and i i hope that people will give you grace on that well thank you i just this the context of this is how can i still be here after 51 years when the average um, activist is, you know, gets this productive primarily for 10 or 15 years and then their energy wanes or they, or they run out of fresh ideas or, or their husband or wife clamps down on them or <laughs> whatever the damn reason that they can't do it anymore or they die. So there's a very long list of sad, sad list to, to me sad of people that are not here that helped, helped me along. But anyway, here's a few, um, not in order of importance, and leaves out a bunch, but certainly I have to list Darlene and Peggy Howell, because they, uh, you know, it's, it's never been easy to run this organization, so, uh, and I know that they have found it, so I'm sure, but the, 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 the names has to be the, right at the top of my list. Um, Sorry, they weren't around in 1970 or 80, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm grateful for the, for the time they spent, have spent so far. Um, Paul Ernsberger, um, who's a scientist. Marilyn Wan, with her book, Fatso, and, and uh, all the wonderful activism that Marilyn has been doing all these years. Um, a uh, lady in New Zealand called Kat Pause, um, and she's Dr. Kat Pause, and she's, uh, you know, an expert in fat, the field called fat studies, and does a almost daily uh, radio blog, which is online. So she has these, these great guests. Um, Deb Burgard, very important person in the movement. Um, Lindo Bacon. I mean, many of these names you're going to recognize, but you know what? There is no living human being who knows every one of these people um, because it cuts across various disciplines. Uh, Lindo Bacon, Phyllis War, uh, Lindley Asline, uh, Lily O'Hara, John Robinson, um, Barbara Bruno. Now, Barbara has been active. In, in NAFA, actually, actually ran a NAFA cha chapter at some point, uh, but also is active in ASDA and a real pioneer. Debbie Kaufman, some of these people are eating disorder specialists. <clears throat> you might wonder, how can an eating disorder specialist be a size activist? Well, if your clients are mostly fat people or thin people who have eating disorders because of fat phobia, it isn't too long before <laughs> you put two and two together and realize that the oppression of fat people is at the root, the root cause of most of this. Uh, Fatima Parker, who's based in London and does stuff in the Arab world, uh, is truly international and I, I admire her work. Es Esther Rothblum, Dr. Esther Rothblum, who's 
uh, leading light in the field of fat studies, which in the world of academics got absolutely no respect for, for the first 20, 30 years. Now, now fat studies is, is regarded just like women's studies. Women's studies were poo-pooed in the academic world for a long time until it wasn't. Um, Rebecca Alexander, who does her work on restaurants and seating capacities and all sorts of wonderful work. Joanne Aikida, who uh, was a pioneering um, registered dietitian, RD, am I, am I correct on that? Uh, she's no longer with us, but she was a real pioneer. Sophie Hagen and in the UK is marvelous. So, you know, is basically a comedian who who puts puts uh, has wonderful things to say on the subject of size acceptance. Sally Smith, who was our executive director for ten or fifteen years, did you know worked her worked her tail off. Um, Conrad Blickenstoffer, who was chair of the board for ten or fifteen years, taught me how to use a computer in the eighties. <clears throat> Thank you, Conrad. Joy Cox, who I look forward to. She was a guest speaker at the at last year's convention, and, and she's she's marvelous and wrote wrote a book. <clears throat> and I'm pleased pleased to see more more and greater diversity in everyone involved in the movement. We have indigenous, we have black people, we have white people. Guilty as charged. Um, my second wife, Nancy Summer was a real pioneer. I learned a lot from her and she learned a lot from me. She's no longer with us either. But Nancy actually put out a print, the print newsletter for, for a year, for uh, 10 years, excuse me. Louise Wolf was, uh, was head of our activism committee. Louise did some really great work on the West Coast. Then there was the Fat Underground in Los Angeles, Al Debron and Judy Free Spirit and also Lynn Mabel Lois. Those guys were so radical that they decided they couldn't be in half a chapter. They had to do their own thing. And alone on the board of directors, I respected their work. No one else on the board did. I said, no, these people really have, we, we should be glad that somebody is doing what they're doing, even if NAFA can't do what they do. Um, Lynn Mabel Lois actually was the feminist name for Lynn McAfee, who's now one of my colleagues on the Council on Size and Weight Discrimination. Um, she's done a radical, she's actually testified to the FDA about acceptance of diet drugs and um, really has done some great things. Reagan Chastain, uh, really a, a great, great name and she's also a, a council a colleague on the council as well uh, and i left a bunch charlotte cooper in the united kingdom um she goes back you know just about 40 or 50 years and she's still active and thank goodness for charlotte cooper who else i leave out probably nobody else no that's that's pretty much i left out lots of people but just i'm talking about the list so um, so one of the things that I asked you about, Bill, when I invited you to do this webinar today um, <clears throat> was, in, was the subject of intersectionality. Because yes. at the 50th anniversary conference, um, you made a statement where you talked about how, you, how looking back over your years in activism, you realize that one of the things that got in the way of NAFA being more intersectional, more intersectional was you. That you realize, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna paraphrase what I think you said and then I, you react to it and you tell me if I got it right. Um, that you realize that part of the reason NAFA focused on fat exclusively and didn't talk about the way that fat oppression interacted with other kinds of oppression was because you helped keep the organization focused only on fat oppression and that you did that to the detriment of voices of people in the organization who were from marginalized identities. Do, 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 am I recalling correctly what you said? Yeah, no, that's correct. Uh, we had, we always, for instance, we always had, um, 
we always had gay members and lesbians, but they all said that, that they felt sort of left, left out of things, even, even though they, <clears throat> they were accepted as people, it's sort of like nobody ever talked about their sexuality or anything. They felt like a, they weren't welcome to. Um, we had black members, but we're, 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 there weren't very many. So why is that? We always ask ourselves that question. Um, we, the board tended to be conservative in many ways. I was the least conservative on the board, but I always took the position, which I now feel is, is wrong, that we could get too easily distracted by getting involved. I mean, we break up into a whole lot of little factions. Some of them, some of them talking about fat black rights, some of them lesbian rights. Uh, we found that oftentimes this interfered with chapters, local chapters would, were often unable to find, for instance, a meeting place because half of the members couldn't afford to go to a place that the other half of the members could afford to go to or a different part of town. And we said, this is just going to, we don't really know what the answer is, but we can only deal with one oppression at a time. And we should stick with, stick with what we do best. And we'll have to find, figure out some other way of attracting minorities because we were never hostile to, the, to other, other, group, other groups. But, and at some point, I think it was in ASDA, we had these issues in ASDA as well. And I, I think it was 10 or 11 years ago that I did an about face on this. I came to realize that oppression, no matter what its cause is, is uh, it's all intersected. It's all intersectional and you can't fight one without fighting the others as well. And I'm sorry if that's going to leave some people behind. There's some people who say, well, I'm in favor of fat rights, but I'm against abortion. So if you guys don't take a strong stand on abortion, then I'm out of here. And what we had to say about things like that is, well, okay, you, you're either with us or you're not with us, but we, we have to, we have to, I mean, we can't ignore 400 years of slavery, excuse me. Uh, we can't ignore the, the fact that <clears throat> maybe, we, maybe we don't have blacks, because a lot of black people, because they can't afford the dues. Maybe we don't have, and I ASDA went through this also. That's when they changed the dues from $50 to a sliding scale. We have people join ASDA who pay $100, and there are people who join paying $3. Is it, is it a matter of that, that let's say, a, a black professional, let's say, an eating disorder specialist, well, they're professional, so they can expect to pay professional dues, right? Well, what if most of their clients are in a poverty-stricken neighborhood and they have a sliding scale and their clients can hardly pay them? And what if they are un underinsured and there's no way that the therapist can be ever get re reimbursed for the time they spent with somebody, but they help them anyway? What about that kind of person? Um, you know, there's a long list of the... I mean, just as, just as fat oppression is deeply entrenched in our whole uh, society, so are the other oppressions in ways that we can't even see unless we're in their shoes. So I today spend a lot of energy, um, well, most of my activism is online now. I don't do talk shows and stuff like that, except... <laughs> except uh, in rare condition times. Um, <clears throat> I think indigenous rights is important. We stole an entire continent away from the native peoples who were here before, before the white Europeans came. And how did we justify it? We thought they were savages. We didn't understand their religion. We didn't care. We were all, you know, felt we had to convert the heathen to Christianity, whether, or whether they liked it or not. And on and on, you know, it's a, how can you, how can you, you can't divorce those other oppressions from our movement, I don't believe. So do you think our, our movement is welcoming now to people who have felt 
marginalized in the greater culture and in our movement? Do you think that um, fat activism has done a good job now? I mean, when you you read you read the list of people that you think are important to the, and you admitted that you don't. It's not a comprehensive list, but when I heard that list, even though you said, our, "I'm so glad our movement is so much more diverse," I think I only heard three people of color on that list. Right, and I and I regret that, but I do I do uh, I do. Uh, one year I remember I <clears throat> there was one year that. A, a group of uh, black activists on at no, no lose did some sort of special fundraiser, and I donated to the fundraiser because I said these these uh, they're probably underfunded, and I don't have a lot of money, but I do have money for for something like that. And you're uh, you're right. This is not a list. These are a list of there there are people on this list who. Several people on that list. I don't know if they're black or white or or, or not, you know, actually. But no, I don't. I think we have a long, long ways to go to make to make people feel really welcome. I think we're going in the right direction, though. I hope. I hope. I mean, I, I hope NAFA is going in the right direction. One of the things that we've worked hard on on the board. Um, one of the things that I hope that I've brought to the board, and that I hope that I bring to the chair position is is really a lot of focus on intersectionality. I know my experiences in fat activism have been um, very much uh, experiences that have to do with like sort of raising awareness about those places where mainstream activism is leaving folks out is um, not acknowledging privilege, is not thinking about who, what's missing, uh, who's missing, who's unacknowledged, um, you know, who, who we look around the room and don't even see is not there. Um, and so I'm really, you know, this is one of the reasons why it was so meaningful to me to hear you acknowledge that at that conference. Because I was in, in the room at that conference looking around going, this is a way more diverse conference than I've, you know, I, I produced things at a couple of NAFA conferences before. <clears throat> and the people I brought with me were a lot of the <laughs> racial diversity at the conference, not exclusively the racial diversity. I don't want to erase other folks who were there, but the folks that I, I brought were a lot of it. Um, and, you know, and I know I will be the second person of color to chair the organization. Phyllis War was the first uh, black woman to chair the board, first black person to chair the board um, as the interim board who, um, who served when a board chair died and served for a short time period. Um, <clears throat> and I believe Lisa Teeler was the first black board member. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Um, and that was just only a few years ago, not 40 years ago, right? And so, um, so I think these, these things are important for, for folks to understand that in 51 years of history, it's only in the last few years that we've been seeing that at a leadership level with the organization. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's ready for a black chair who talks a lot about race, which I do. Um, so we're going to see how our membership <laughs> responds to that. Well, um, I'm, re I'm ready. <laughs> well, thank you. Good. I'm back, back <laughs> up. And clearly you're willing to talk, you know, you just said white people stole the continent from indigenous people. So clearly you're ready to have a, a kind of dialogue that not all folks are interested in having. And um, um, I do also, while we're on this subject, I just, just want to footnote something from earlier in the conversation, and then we'll take a couple of the questions that are in the chat. Um, I do want to go back to where you talked about what else was happening in the world um, at the time that NAFA is founded, and I just want to make these historical footnotes, um, because you talked about the Stonewall Rebellion as something that um, was, uh, that, that was something that was, um, involving gay men. And I think it's yes. really important to note that it was actually two trans women of color who started the Stonewall Rebellion. Ah. So even though many of the participants in that act in that action were gay men, that it was two trans women, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia, um, 
Sylvia Rivera, I think. Um, sorry if I'm getting their names wrong, but who started that? Um, and also, you mentioned that Gloria Steinem was the founder of Ms. Magazine or that she took Ms. Mag Magazine over. She was a co-founder of Ma Ms. Magazine with um, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, who's an African-American woman. So I think it's important for us to know that. Um, when we thought about celebrating NAFA's 50th anniversary one of the, last year, one of the things I did not think about was how many other huge historical 50th anniversaries were happening at the same time. And it wasn't until Trevor Kezar, who um, is the host of The Big Fat Gay and is a journalist and was with us at the convention, um, mentioned to me that he had tried to pitch some stories in NAF national media about NAFA's 50th anniversary and got told by some media outlets that there were too many other big anniversaries happening at the same time, <laughs> um, that it occurred to me just how many 50th anniversaries were at the same time, because I was mostly thinking about Sesame Street's 50th anniversary. Um, but <laughs> You know, there were so many, you know, that historical framing is really important, 1969 and everything else that was going on in the world at the same time. Um, I forgot to mention that the president at the, of the United States at the time was Richard Nixon. And it was the height of the Vietnam War. So one of the things that we sometimes face in fat activism is being told that we should table the cause because there are other more important causes to be dealt with. Did you face that in 1969 when you tried to talk about fat rights or at any of the other points during your 51 years in the movement, have you heard that argument that we should stop talking about fat people because there are bigger, more important social causes that need to be dealt with first? I think the kind of people that said things like that tended to tri trivialize or poo poo fat rights. Um, you know, that they weren't willing to say, well, what you're doing is important, but you should pause it. Those are people who weren't willing to acknowledge that what we were doing was important. Um, generally, I didn't run into, the biggest resistance I, I, I got wasn't along those lines. It was along the lines of, well, we always got crap from, from liberals who, who said things like that, but basically said, well, fatties can just lose weight if they want to, kind of thing. And, you know, they're um, creating the worldwide, they're contributing to worldwide hunger by, by uh, you know, eating more than they should. That sort of attitude you'd get from some liberal people. We were more, we were more embraced by conservatives than liberals, by the way. Which, you, you know, on, on that note, one of the saddest things that happened to me recently is that I discovered that in, you know, NAFA's bipartisan, I'm not here to make a statement about one or the other of our current presidential candidates, but I will say that one of them has t-shirts available up to a size 5X and the other does not. And it is disappointing to me which one is the one has t-shirts available up to a size 5X. <sighs> Yes, uh, I, can, I can only imagine. And it's, you know, it, it is interesting to note how often the folks who share our politics in so many other ways that seem to share our values that we talked about intersectionality and the ways that systems of oppression work, you know, work against people in marginalized communities and, and where that intersects and, and the people that um, want to work against those systems in so many ways seem to have a barrier at in often in being able to process how those same systems not only work against fat people but then also can use anti-fatness to work against some of the same people that we're fighting discrimination against you know one of the things we sometimes talk about in NAFA is how anti-fatness can actually be a backdoor method of employing transphobia, transphobia, homophobia, anti-blackness, other kinds of racism, because if there are laws against those things, but there are no laws against fat phobia, then if you, for example, hate your black employee and can't fire them because they're black, but they happen to be fat, you can fire them for that, you know, and we don't think about the way that um, we, you know, like obviously we should have rights as fat people just inherently because we should have rights. But then also we can use anti-fatness as a 
as an extra way <laughs> to discriminate against other people. And, um, and it's actually some of the most progressive mm -hmm. folks who don't understand the politics of that. That's, that's very true. Uh, two, two quick stories. Um, I'm just full of stories. I could probably put everyone to sleep with all my stories. We're awake uh, over here. We've got some questions <laughs> for you from the chat. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to get the, get to the couple of questions that are in the chat and then we'll have time for a couple more from there. So while Bill's telling these stories, if you've got more questions, go ahead and load those into the chat. Um, and we're going to go for just a few more minutes here before we wrap up. All right. Story number one is early in our, um, formation that I think probably within the first year, there was a national case which made drew some attention about a high school a female high school gym teacher who was fired for being fat and this this backs up to what you said and we said oh that's a perfect case for us we should somehow get involved in that and maybe we can help uh, it might be good publicity so Lauterbach looked into it and he said this case is not a good one for us because they are not firing her because she is fat. That's what they're telling people they're firing her for. What they're really firing her for is the fact that she's a lesbian and she's running the girl's gym class. Wow. That was in a Western state. And I said, well, so we've got really more than one battle to fight here. And I said, this is going to be, we don't have resources for this, not with six, $6 memberships coming in. The other story is that uh, when I first began to realize that there was this was going to be a real waltz to try to get people, is that the right word? Uh, going to have to step pretty lively to, to get people together. Was for our first meeting in Staten Island at Lou Lauterbach's house. We were planning the, the, the I made several trips out there to meet with him and his wife. And they offered their living room and they said, we're not going to travel. We don't travel at all. Uh, we could go into Manhattan. Anything is mass transportation, but forget about holding meetings anywhere else. So they offered their living room. And so th that was okay. We scheduled, we planned on that, except that I came to realize that there was a large artwork over their fireplace in the living room and that it was how should i say erotic and this, uh, some people might even think semi-pornographic depending on what shoes you're standing in and i said there is one problem most of the people coming to the first meeting are conservative catholics you know, uh, I should say, uh, devout Catholics. Our lawyer was, and two or three or four of the other board members were, and my wife at the time wasn't a conservative Catholic. She was Jewish, but she would also have regarded that painting as offensive. So I said, there's just one thing. Uh, I don't know if you're willing to do this, but could you mind, I know it's a terrible and unreasonable, but could you move that painting? just for the meeting and then put it back afterwards. We may never have this problem again, but for the first meeting. So they objected, but they said, we'll do it just to get, you know, to be cooperative. And I said, well, I, I don't know how much time, how many times we're gonna run into stuff like that, but they did it. They put another painting up, but people have, you know, how are you going to get so many people inside the tent when they're all coming from all these different places? Right. There was one year that the board was asked to give an award to a lesbian magazine on the West Coast. Uh, I forget their name for some fat coverage they had. And it seemed like an open and shut case. They deserved the award. Half the board members were opposed. It's a lesbian magazine. We don't want our members to think we're in favor of that sort of thing. That was included from two men on the board at that particular moment were gay men. And they were also opposed to the lesbian magazine. 
you know, this is what I had. This is the kind of shit crap I had to deal with. <laughs> anyway, uh, it ended up passing by one vote. Somebody, somebody, I said, as chair, I was would have been, if it had been a tie vote, okay, I could have broke the tie. But it wasn't a tie vote, but somebody, somebody else, uh, I think, made it a tie, and then I broke the tie. How could something like that be, you know, they were worried about what the members might think. Well, I mean, and we, we've had reactions like that from members. I mean, even doing something as small as sharing a, you know, a rainbow colored happy pride month meme. We've, you know, we've not had overwhelming reactions like that from members, but we have had members say like, what is this doing on your webpage? Or what is this doing on your Facebook page? Well, so um, and, you know, we had, uh, we've, we've put out a Black Lives Matter statement. We didn't get overwhelming negative response, we, you know, but we, you know, like we, the people are going to react and, you know, it's up to the board to do what the board thinks is best for the majority of the membership and according to what we stand for as an organization and what we think is in line with the organization's values. And mm. then we'll see how that goes, I guess. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I I most of the majority of my activism is on LinkedIn, and that's where I do most of my sins, including black and indigenous work, is on LinkedIn and and fat as well. And um, uh, you know, but it's sort of like Facebook is a different thing. You've got neighbors, relatives on Facebook, people who are vastly different political persuasions than myself. Um, the times I post anything about fat on my Facebook feeds to the entire list of Facebook friends, which is about a thousand, I often regret it because I end up with people engaged in fist fights with each other. You know, I have to separate my list out to people that do obje don't object to getting fat stuff and those who do object to getting fat stuff. So you, you walk a fine line sometimes. But some things are so important that I say, I don't care if they don't like it. If I lose friends, I'm going to po post it anyway. Well, I mean, I guess part of the question is always um, how we define what friends are. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, and you, you've mentioned that several points during the interview. I mean, you have several points during this session, that idea of losing friends because of your beliefs about fat people and their rights and or fat or your attractions to fat people or your relationships to fat people and what that meant about how you had to redefine your relationships with other people. Yeah, and it gets really hairy if you're talking about relatives. I mean, you've got to deal with relatives. I mean, I had my... <laughs> My my second wife's mother once knew knew about my fat activism, but once when she when I was out of the room, she took my wife aside and she said, "Bill doesn't love you because he lets you be fat." What do you do with people who think that way? You know, that's wrong in so many ways. <laughs> So many of us have experienced people ourselves who think that way, though, that we don't love ourselves or that that's the way that they must show us love when we deal with it all the time, right? Yeah. Um, so from the chat, a couple of questions and observations from the chat. Uh, one person mentioned as we were talking about dating that even though there are many dating services available now, it's so much harder for fat people to find good dates. Um, you talked a lot about the, the ways that social life um, in fat community has changed since other dating services, dating um, social and nightlife opportunities have come up in other areas in fat life so that it doesn't have to be done within the activist world, but that there are right. other organizations that plan things, um, but that it's still, um, you know, but this, um, this participant observes that it's, it's still really hard for fat people to find good dates. Um, do you have any tips from your 51 years of observing <laughs> that community? Well, all I can you've say you've mostly is, done that in activist spaces, but you've been you've but that means you've interacted with people who move in lots of different fat community spaces. Do you have any tips? Yeah, tip number one is the old adage about I love old adages. 
a good man is hard to find. Um, is that a tip or is that just a fact? That's an observation. Um, I've also, when people ask for actual advice, I always say, just stay, stay involved. I mean, join committees, church groups, places you wouldn't normally expect to, to uh, do not, repeat, do not expect to find Mr. Wright in a singles bar. Instead of a singles bar, you should join the PTA or something. Uh, just remain active because as uh, my experience as, as uh, whether, you're, whether a, a man or a woman is actually specifically attracted to a larger person or just size neutral, either way, the point is that a lot of people push potential partners away, assuming that no one could find them interesting. I, I think it has to do with number one, circulation, and number two, going to the right venues where you're gonna meet res respectful, interesting people. I mean, my, I met wife number two on a NAFA committee. I worked with her for a year before I even considered her a possible date potential. And uh, we were married for 25 years, so that's, that ain't bad. Well, we do have committees that folks can join if they're interested in working on some projects with us, but we're certainly not doing any in-person committee meeting now. Um, <clears throat> so the, the I'm sorry is, that we, we can't really help folks with that at this time. The other thing uh, is, the other thing is, but uh, yeah, that, that is, it's hard to be, to circulate at the present time with pandemic. Um, the other thing is work on yourself. I mean, be an interesting person. Uh, life has got all sorts of things having nothing to do with dating or the, or potential partners. You know, music, art, whatever. And I mean, I know, I know people in the performing arts who say, I know women who, who, who told me, yeah, that's all great, except that all the, all the, all the men in, that I meet in music are gay. You know, opera, that sort of thing. Well, all right, but just have lots of friends. You never know. You might meet somebody through a friend um, when you least expect it. Just don't push away people if they seem moderately interested in you, merely because you can't imagine that they would find you interesting. Be interesting. And I, I should just say that I should just say that the 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 participant in the chat did not ask for dating advice. I added that question. They just observed that it's hard out there, oh, yeah. and I just want to affirm it is. And yes, I agree. And the sociocultural BS that adds layers on top of that is not something that we can fix by just working on ourselves. That is sociocultural bullshit that is bigger than any kind of like personal stuff we can do or just joining committees and getting to know more people and making friends. The bigger cultural things that feed into why some people uh, over, overlook us, outrule us, uh, don't choose us is is bigger than us. And that is a frustration that is um, like, I don't want to be dismissive of. And I did not mean for my question about um, dating advice to be dismissive of that observation. So participant, um, I did not <laughs> tend to put any words in your mouth by asking that question on top of your observation. Okay, um, good. Uh, I, what, I do have one piece of advice though. Yes. Which is, whether you be a man or a woman, if you're involved with someone, if you're fat and you're involved with someone who doesn't want you to meet their friends or their mother, drop them like a hot potato. You know, you gotta find somebody who is not ashamed or embarrassed to be seen with you. Nobody, yeah, I, I hope none of us have to endure that from people who are trying to be with us. I've known lots of people that did, though. Lots of people have, and lots of people have. Um, I hope for better for all of us. Um, 
the, there was a question about how many members we have in Napa. I know that question got answered in the chat, but for folks who are watching who are curious, we currently have about a thousand members in Napa. We have lots of folks who participate without officially being members. Lots of our programming is available to the public, so you don't have to be a member. For example, these webinars are available to the public, um, but we have about a thousand members, about a thousand people on our membership list. Um, over the years, Napa went from uh, that first meeting that Bill described to having chapters all over the country and then back down to having a more sort of a national membership without individual local chapters in various places. So we sort of operate as a, a national organization uh, with sort of our home base being online um, versus having um, versus having local chapters at this time. We do have a few local groups on Facebook, but um, but they don't um, they don't meet in in person so much. So we um, our home base right now is online, and um, and our uh, board of directors is in various places around the country, and we also meet online. Um, and then I think this is actually this question from the chat is actually a great one for us to sort of wrap up on. Um, do you think that fat acceptance is better today than it was when you started? Um, and what do you think needs, still needs to be worked on the most? Wow. Well, that's a challenging question. I think like all social movements, there's progress in some ways and there's just a step backward in some ways. Um, and it will probably always be that way. Um, I can tell you, for me, as an observer, um, I think the the fashion world is ten times better than it was, um, you know, fifty years ago. I reported I could only buy w one blouse for my first wife. Now, the fashion world has a lot wrong with it. For for one thing, as much progress as there has been. There's, there's a, a dearth of stuff above size 22 or size 24 um, for most retailers. And, you know, I, I'm on some, in some groups that, that debate about the whole fashion world. And um, there's still, there's still an, a certain elitism or arrogance on the part of the industry in terms of larger, larger um, customers. So, but not, Nonetheless, you actually have fat fashion shows. NAFA was the first one to do it, by the way, um, in 71 or 72 at our first convention. Um, so that's an area. And I was gonna say the medical area, even though people have lots of nightmarish problems with doctors and the whole medical system as it is, it actually was worse 50 years ago. Um, you actually have doctors who publicly state that it is wrong to bully or stigmatize fat people, that it is a barrier to their health care and to their sense of well-being and may actually contribute to their medical problems to stigmatize them. Uh, Obesity Canada is one of, the, one of the groups like that. Well, yeah, they still think fat is a disease. I disagree with them. But they actually, you know, have come part of the distance. That's what you, if you ask any 10 doctors, you'll get 10 different answers on this. I had an MD once say to me, who treated my second wife for a sprained ankle. I said, doctor, I thank, thank you very much for being so thoughtful and considerate and taking the time to deal with, you know, the problems that Nancy's having. And he said, well, it's the only way I feel a doctor should be. He said, I know some of my doctors are really nasty to their fat patients. I feel badly about that. I want to apologize to you for that, for that fact. There are doctors who feel that way. I had, I had a doctor who, who I thanked for dealing with my first wife and her, and her, despite her size, and I thanked him. I always thank people when they do good stuff. And he said, well, he said, my attitude is <clears throat> in dealing with patients and they come in and they're fat. If, if they're fat and if they could have done something about it, they would have. It is not, not my place to, to try to be the one to, 
tell them what to do, even though I'm a doctor. I just treat whatever they came in for. Great attitude. And he was kindly. Actually, this doctor came to my first wedding. So that's another story. He was a family friend. Uh, so those are two, two areas. Uh, but there are, there's also uh, the media. The, well, the media is, is still a mixed bag. You'll read one thing that's positive, and the next day you'll read something's negative. So I don't know. I got my ear to the ground, and I keep, keep close tabs on, on what's going on. Seating, <laughs> seating in restaurant seating, still a nightmare for some people. I mean, one of my jobs as the husband of a large woman, and right now I'm engaged to somebody for, for 10 years who experiences this too, um, which is, I'm a scout. I go into a restaurant first to see what the seating is like before we even step foot in there as a couple or a theater, that sort of thing. We wanted to hear the, the, the comedian Robert Klein at the Westbury, uh, not Westbury, at the, in Woodstock, in the theater in Woodstock. But I went in the day before and I talked to the custodial people and I talked about special seating and, and um, spent probably two or three hours staking out the place and made sure I bought tickets that would, would match the, right, the, right, the best seats. But people shouldn't have to do that. I mean, Re what's the name? Rebecca Alexander is, is uh, no, yeah, Rebecca Alexander is doing work on that, on the, on the West Coast, I think Seattle maybe. Um, why don't we rate restaurants and public places that have seats and give them a gold star if they have good seats and some, some seats that you can fit in and uh, a flexible management attitude about it and, you know, and, and uh, you know, that sort of thing. I once did a survey of, of all the seating in Carnegie Hall before they refurbished Carnegie Hall. <clears throat> and found that the seats in the th entire place varied from 14 inches between arms and to 19 inches between arms. Unbelievable. And management said, well, if you have problems with the seating, just get a box seat. Well, of course, box seating at Carnegie yeah, Hall. <laughs> afford to do that. You can always throw money at a problem, you know. It's, uh, it's been progress to see that some theaters well, theaters tend to be closing right now, but some theaters have taken out seats and allowed room for a scooter or a wheelchair. You, know, you never used to be able to do that. A lot of uh, grocery stores have, have, and big box stores have, have scooters. Most of them do. Some of the scooters have 600 pound weight limits, not 300 pound weight limits. So it's a mixed bag. And it's probably always going to be that way because there's always going to be people in any social change who don't approve of it or they don't want to spend the money on it or all that kind of stuff. Do you think people are more comfortable using the word fat without it being an insult? Some are, some aren't. It's still a painful word to some people. But so is the word obese and or overweight a painful word to other people. So we still haven't solved that problem. I used to write for Radiance Magazine for large women when it was still, still a thing. And I did a column once on euphemism for fat, for the word fat. I came up with a hundred different words that are all euphemisms for the word fat. You know, uh, rotund, big boned, um, you know, uh, things, things like uh, appellations like, um, you know, uh, hippo or elephant or cow, on and on, all kinds of respectful animal, respectable animals. Um, long list. <coughs> Did you ever... Um... In the UK, in the UK, if you have a so-called spare tire in the middle, around your middle, they say you have Dunlop's disease. Now that one I have not heard. I've heard a lot of those other ones, but. Dunlop is a UK tire manufacturer. I've not heard that one. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> well, <laughs> congratulations. Now you have. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, add it to the list. I keep a list of favorites. Um, did you, when you were starting NAFA 51 years ago, did you ever think of calling it something else? Well, I did call it something else. I called it NAFA, N A F A. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, N A F A, National Association for Fat Americans. Yes. I thought that the presence of thin people would just be as allies, it would be of fat Americans. Mm -hmm. It was our attorney who suggested that we'd be more likely to get a tax exempt status if we said to aid fat Americans. So we added the word aid after the first meeting. I still have old folders that are just marked NAFA. Let, let me rephrase my question. Did you ever think about using a word other than the word fat? The National Association for Large Americans, the National Association for Heavy Americans, any of those other words? Um, it was discussed, and I think I didn't favor anything other than the word fat, and neither did Lauterbrook. Latterback, his title was, was fat power, that everything else is a euphemism, just beating around the bush, call a spade a spade. There are going to be people who don't like fat, and it's going to stand in the way of our way sometimes. Um, and then it came time to change the name in the late 80s. Because uh, there were always people who objected to every word in our, in our name, every, every single word. Americans, well, what about Canadians? We had Canadian members. Um, aid, they said, well, let's take out aid because we're not an aid group. We don't hand out grants to people because they have trouble finding a, a large size wheelchair that they can afford. We can't really say we aid them. Anyway. Uh, that's when uh, the president, but then we said, we're, we, well, we were kind of stuck with NAFA and all the reference materials, N-A-A-F-A. -A so what, what other name can we come up with that agrees with the acronym N-A-A-F-A? -A -A? So fat stayed. And so, there, there are those that say, well, that's, that's to the good. Let's, let's get rid of the acronyms. Let's, let's take back the word. Just like, and, you know, going back 50 years, you said Negro, you didn't say black or 60 years. Black was considered a kind of uh, almost an insult. I'm sorry, you don't, you don't, you're not around long enough to, to know that. Uh, you probably know, I don't know if you know that. You didn't well, say I, black. I don't know it from lived experience, but I, I also live in a black family and know things that beyond my own lived experience. So yes, I, I'm familiar with this idea. And, uh, Gays, you have um, 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 you have queer. Queer was always a critic, uh, you know, used as a as a put down of a gay person. You're you're a queer. So they took back the word. Now it's used, you know. And when a group uses a word often like that, then then the outsiders can no longer use it as a criticism. So was that your intention in using fat? Yeah, that's a good question. It kind of stumps me. I'm not really sure. I know that I didn't like euphemisms and neither did Lauterbach. The others were okay with it. But I, it, you know, I, but I respect the fact that it is a painful word for to some people. So let's try to make it less painful. I do want to ask you one more question about the name, which is that I have actually heard people say that, um, that they they feel like the name change in the did you say it was in ninety one what what year did you say the name change happened well we debated it for for three years and then we took a vote of the members in eighty eight in eighty eight so that they feel like that name change was um was specifically to make the name sound more like the name of the NAACP and that they feel like that was appropriative Is oh what was it meant to no sound more like the TV? I've heard that I've heard that question only once in all these years, and uh, it was definitely not on anybody's mind that that would be the case. So, where do you think that misunderstanding comes from? Well, I don't know. NAA, I mean, CP and FA, kind of different. <laughs> I don't know. Well, did people ever refer to it as the N? 
A A F A, or was it? Did you guys always say NAFA? Yeah, we always said NAFA. One of our goals in the beginning was to make it pronounceable. And N A A C P is not pronounceable. You have to you have to spell it out. So it's kind of a, like comparing a, a a leopard with a porcupine. Um, Bill, do you have anything? I don't have any other questions from you in the chat. I have a million other questions that I could ask you. Um, oh, hold on. I uh, do want to mention a couple of things people have mentioned in the chat. Um, you talked about businesses, uh, you talked about ways to rate businesses in terms of their accessibility, particularly for larger bodies. Um, Ample App and All Go are two apps that do that. And I think they do have some restrictions to different parts of the company, the different parts of the country, but you can download those apps for yourself and see how they work in your area. Ample app and all go app. If you're with us now live, they're um, they're mentioned in the chat, and uh, if if not, we'll mention them in the comments on the YouTube video later. And then um, someone also mentions the Instagram account at the Beauty in Obesity as an account that folks might want to check out. Um, they do note that. Um, we in our uh, activist community are not fond of the word obesity because it has medical pathology um, associated with it, but that the account is worth looking at in terms of interesting images that you might um, might be able to see there. Um, there aren't any more questions for you from the live audience though, Bill. Do you have anything that I did not ask you about that you would really like to share with us today? Oh, maybe. And there's one more name, uh, some, some lady that I derive a lot of inspiration from, and that's Jess Baker, who, was, who spoke at last year. Yeah, I think Jess Baker is an absolute genius. I'm, I'm sorry to, to not mention her name. Um, questions, well, I don't know. Um, I'm 79 years old. Uh, I guess looking back on things, you could ask me the question of, of uh, would I do it again? That's those kinds of things, you know? And so if you ask me the question, would I do it again? The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, but it's impossible to tell what my life would have been without it or what other people's lives would have been without it. I can't even think, imagine how it would have been different. I can tell you this, that if someone, you know, I was 27 when I started this, 20, 26, if you actually look at, when I started working on it. I have to tell you, I worked, I wrote Ladder Back the Ladder, and then I, I learned that he was working on the book, and I actually put it off for a year, starting NAFA, and helped him research, do some research for the book. Because I said, what's a movement without a book? And um, they only printed about 4,000, it's now considered a rare book. I have two of the two of the four thousand copies in, in. Is that the one you wanted to show? You had mentioned earlier you had a book you wanted to show us. Oh, did I forget to do that? That's it. That's it. That's a good a good quality copy with the with the the the, the dust jacket intact. Unfortunately, it doesn't have Lou Lauderback's signature in it. <laughs> um, but it's a rare book. If you you can go out and probably get one for one hundred and fifty bucks. I don't know. Um, as I say, they only printed 4,000 copies. As a matter of fact, the story about the publisher, the publisher, he had, he had um, an editor at his publisher who was in favor of this book. But the editor left the publisher, and the pub leaving nobody at the publisher who was in favor of the book. And they tried to kill the book. And eventually, they sold the manuscript for the book to another publisher along with a hundred other books. And they had no interest in publishing it really, but in the end they did, but they killed his footnotes. <coughs> Excuse me. They had wonderful footnotes and they killed it. And Lou had long since disposed of his copy of his footnotes. And because people for, for decades have been saying, how did he, what did he, what was this army study? What was it? Where do you find that? Well, 
today with Google, you can find almost anything. So fortunately, uh, what, what, what was the story I was trying to tell you? Oh yeah, if somebody had told me just how difficult this was gonna be and just how it was gonna change my life, it might have given me pause. Probably not. I was pig-headed enough to go ahead with it anyway, but really looking back on it, I mean, there were times I was pretty much despairing that, that anything was going to happen. Um, uh, I came to see my task as one of keeping things going until some real talent arrived. <laughs> and... Uh, so that's I succeeded in doing that, thank goodness. Oh, here's another one. We used to have address, our membership list used to be on addressograph plates, you know, where you couldn't sit down at a computer and keyboard something. We had a big rotating wheel. You would have to emboss one letter at a time in this metal plate. And I used to have high school people, girls primarily, come in and I think they made $2 an hour embossing these plates for new members. Every couple of weeks, we'd have to, you know, revise this. That was one of the things we got rid of when we went to Sacramento. We got rid of this two-ton embossing machine. Oh, I have all sorts of stories like that. I didn't know how difficult it was going to be to get tax-exempt status. We applied. First of all, we had to incorporate in the city, in the state of New York. Well, that doesn't sound like a big deal. Lawyer said it would be okay. We just had to do this, this, and this, and set up a constitution and jump through hoops. We did all that. And then the application went in. We submitted the application to the state of New York. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. So I said to the lawyer, have you heard anything yet? We haven't. Have you got anything? Are we incorporated? He says, no, I'll look into it. So... He gets back to me next week. He said, I play golf with the, with the judge, he said, who approves these things. He said, uh, who, by the way, was a Republican. And, uh, and he says, I asked him on the golf course. I said, did you get an application from the National Association of Aid Fat Americans? The judge said, yeah, I did. <laughs> and the lawyer, and my, our lawyer said, well, you know, are you, are you really going to rule on that? Well, I, and so the judge said, well, I, I didn't do anything about it. I assumed it was a prank. The lawyer Everybody said, thought it was a prank. So our lawyer said, no, it really, it's for real. And these people are, and I'm, and I'm their, I'm their pro bono attorney and I represent them. And so it was approved next week, the following week. And we got all the New York state, papers to show the approval of it, which is one of the things going to the Cornell archive, by the way, the actual judge's signature and all that. That's fantastic. But, yeah. That only happened because our lawyer played golf with the judge. Jeez. I, um, I usually end with that question, but I'm going to ask one more indulgent, self-indulgent question. And thanks to everybody who's hung in here with us um, for all this time. Um, Bill, do you have any advice for me as the next chair? Oh, gosh. Having been the first chair, the first chair, that sounds almost musical. <clears throat> I don't know, there have been a lot of good chairs uh, since, since I uh, retired. Advice. Well, you may not need any of my advice because you're probably going to do just fine. You're, you've got bring a lot of talent with you and you've got good instruction, good ins people to instruct you. Um, I guess the standing advice for any leader in size acceptance is, is um, take heart. Know that for every person who thanks you for your work, there's probably a hundred out there that have been impacted by it and and you may not hear from until maybe 10 years later. Um, I, I still run into people now and then who say, you know, I just got to tell you, <clears throat> I first heard of NAFA when I was 15 years old. 
and it made it possible for me to get through high school. <clears throat> I heard from another lady, I went to a conference. The predecessor is of ASDO was an organization called AHELP. I went to an AHELP conference in the 1990s. A woman comes up to me and she says, you don't know me, but I've been reading your stuff for all these years. She said, thank goodness for NAFA. She said, I inherited a weight loss franchise with uh, three, three different locations from, from my parents. And she said, after you know, getting to know all about NAFA and size acceptance, she says, I, uh, I got rid of them. She says, I, wow. <clears throat> you know, I, I sold them off. I mean, they still existed, but they, they don't exist anymore, I'm sure. But she says, says, I just couldn't in good conscience continue running a weight loss company. So things like that, I consider part of the paycheck. If I can get rid of three weight loss franchises, I will get <laughs> for a success, a stunning success. Another thing is what you really need as a leader is, is, is humility to realize that there are some people that despite your best efforts, you are not going to be able to help. Uh, that people have resources that they may call upon that you would not have recommended necessarily. Somebody may arrive at the idea that human being is precious because uh, you know uh, Jesus loves you or something, or or uh, uh, <clears throat> you know have have some other reason that you may not necessarily personally agree with. But people people get the wait a minute. Get rid of this. Hold on, sorry, should have been. So as I think, <clears throat> what, what I was saying was some humility is, 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 is really important. And that people, people know that you, you know, I mean, so you stick by your guns, but there's a, it's, there's a balancing act here. Um, depending on how many individual people in crisis, you know, fires you're called to put out. And just to realize that some things are not, are not within the power of leadership to solve. So go easy on yourself. Don't judge yourself harshly if you find it difficult. I will try to remember that part. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right, Darlene? Uh, this is these good, good tips? Or? <laughs> Darlene. Um, thank you for your time, Bill. Thank you for all of your contributions to the movement over all of these years. Um, and thank you for your candor and your willingness to self-reflect. I think that, um, you know, your, your willingness to, to look back, not just on your successes, but also to talk about the ways that you, um, you know, that, that you see that you could have done it differently is really helpful to all of us in the movement and to thinking about how we go forward from here. So I appreciate that you were willing to, to be vulnerable in that way um, and to, you know, to examine with us the whole picture. I wish that we had more time to examine other parts of the picture. Um, as I said, we, you know, we can certainly do this again or we can do this in other, other ways. Um, um, as Bill mentioned, he's on LinkedIn. That's a good place to find him if you're on there and you um, and you um, want to follow his current activism. Um, Bill is still working with the um, Council for Size and Weight Discrimination. Their website is cswd.org. And you have recently completed your work with ASDA, is that correct? No, I'm still on the membership committee of ASDA. The membership committee, okay. I was, I was the chair for six years until, until it timed out. Oh, that's but, right. I just yes. remember you, you told me you'd completed something in your responsibilities there. So you're still on the membership committee and an active member of, um, of NAFA. So we look forward to seeing you participating in lots of our upcoming um, programming. And, um, and what else? What else should we be looking for from you in the future? Well, I'm also on Facebook, but less of a, less as a fat, well, I do fat activist stuff there too, but only on the individual groups, not 
not overall too much. And um, I don't know what I want to say. You know, if you're if you're a leader uh, of any kind, one of the, the it's an exciting thing to do, but it also you have to as as you in it for a while, you have to fight a battle to remain relevant. So part of what I do is a struggle to remain relevant and uh, productive. And um, you know that's 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 part of the part of the challenge, I guess, <clears throat> which not everybody not everybody understands. You know, I'm sure that you know, everybody has some family members or friends who don't understand why you would put energy into it. I had people say, "What? You're not paid? You're not paid for this? You go on Phil Donahue? Nobody pays you to do that." Well, how can you do that? Why would you even consider doing that? I mean, you're a, my accountant is another one who, who didn't understand. He said, well, you and your wife would be millionaires if you had put the kind of energy into a business that you put into, you know, your size acceptance. He says, I don't understand why you do that. And my answer to him is, I guess, I guess being a millionaire is not one of my priorities because I don't want to have to pick my friends based on whether they can help me be a millionaire or not. And he still doesn't understand, but he's a good accountant. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, yes, we are, we are an all volunteer board over here at NAFA. Um, and we um, certainly appreciate the contributions of people to NAFA and um, folks who want to do that should do that on our website so that we can keep on offering these kinds of things free to the community so that um, we can keep doing this work just like you are. I've got a, <clears throat> another thought pops into my mind, which is that, which I've observed all these years, which is that if somebody decides to form another organization, whether it be in New Zealand or Australia or right here in the United States, um, this is not a threat. This is a, a, you know, a good thing because there are so many different ways of going about, um, I was gonna say skin in the cat, but I don't wanna say that. Uh, there's so many different approaches to this. That's why I was so open to the Fat Underground in, in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, there, are, there are other organizations that are doing things, no lose. None of these are competitors. I mean, just, I join everything and, and be uh, be happy they exist, because they may be addressing some aspect of size that is difficult for an organization to do. I said, if we if we did stuff like they did in the Fat Underground, we would have lost our tax exempt status. You know, so be glad that there are people willing to do that stuff. Absolutely, I think that's actually a lovely note to end on, Bill. And and Joy and Dr. Joy Cox, as I said, will be here with us next um, on October twenty fourth. And in her book, um, Fat Girls in Black Bodies, she talks about some of the Black women who have started organizations that specifically meet some of the the the, the needs that are specific to Black community and Fat women in Black community. And um, and as Bill just mentioned, No Lose was uh, No Lose was actually started started as an organization of fat lesbians. Um, there, are a, there are numerous organizations that meet needs that NAFA doesn't meet. Um, I should mention that Fat Rose, which is an organization that does, um, uh, that also does fat activism and is located in the Bay, but is working on um, a fat Midwestern and Southern convening, which is coming up um, in late October. And if you just Google Fat Rose Midwestern and Southern convening, it's an online convening. So folks who are interested in that um, can learn more about what they're doing. So there's lots of activism elsewhere besides NAFA. And it is one of our goals as an organization to, um, to build more uh, relationships with other folks who are doing that work. So if you are watching this webinar and you're interested in that, please contact us through our website or I'm, I am the only tigress at NAFA. So it's easy to find <laughs> me as the, um, the <coughs> most places. Um, it's easy to find me at, and um, you know, reach out to our board. 
um, reach out to us through our website. We're happy to network with other organizations who are doing this work and, um, you know, and see how we can support each other. Because even though, as Bill said, we may have different methods, we have the same goals, which is equality at every size. So, um, so I think that's, um, do you want to share a final thought? One final thing. <clears throat> I don't want to always be the one with the last word. So I, I'm sorry, I, that's not my intention. Another thing pops into my head, you ask for advice. It is totally normal for anyone in size acceptance leadership to have a day where they get up and, they, and where they feel overwhelmed and think that, you know, get, have feelings of negativity even maybe about their own size. Oh shit, this is, the, this is the day I have to go to the doctor and I'm gonna go through this grief or I can't find the right pantyhose I want, whatever. You know, to question their, their dedication just for that day. And everybody goes through this. Even, even priests go through this, you know, times of, of, of doubt. So my, my word on that is, that is normal. It is absolutely, you know, don't feel deterred by that or feel you're a bad leader by that if that happens to you. And, <clears throat> and also, I don't care what you weigh. If you get bigger, you get smaller. You know, it's none of my business what you weigh as long as you're still the tigress. Eternally the tigress, Bill. <laughs> I, I'm 12 years in. I've been bigger and smaller, and I've had exactly the days you're talking about, and I'm still here. So, we're gonna see what we're gonna see where it takes us next. Both of sounds, us. Sounds like you have it covered. I hope so. I hope so. We're gonna see where it takes us next. Um, Bill's on 51 years. I think I'm on, I don't know, 13 years, something like that. We just see if I can catch up with him one day. Uh, <laughs> And uh, thank you all for being here, no matter whether this is your first NAFA anything or whether you've also been in it for many, many years. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you being with us. Um, thank you, Darlene, um, for um, womaning the controls back there and also for leading the board for these last five years. And um, this webinar will be available on YouTube soon. So if you'd like to share it with others in community, please do. I'm sure Bill will be sharing the link on his LinkedIn page. And, um, and uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you October 24th with Dr. Joy Cox. Thanks again, Bill. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs>